Andrew Brandt teaches at Villanova, Sunday 7 newsletter, of which I am a subscriber from Sports Illustrated, Business of Sports, former Packers executive. You have a long bio, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Always good to be with you. I say I have a lot of jobs, so I don't have to have a real one. That's the key. <laughs> it allows you to uh, to do a lot of hiking and uh, training, because I know you you run triathlons, right? Yeah, I do. I just try to stay up with my fitness. And uh, yeah, like, I, like you said, I do a lot of different things. Um, but, you know, since I left the Packers several years ago, it's been a nice life where I can sort of manage everything on my terms rather than, say, the team's terms. I would just say that you are my idol uh, in that <laughs> regard. Uh, let's get to this uh, the verdict, which I'm not su- entirely surprised, and here's why. Um, I read an article, and I, I think this has to be 10, maybe 15 years ago, because I was digging into uh, the Sunday ticket, not phenomenon, but it was still relative. was because it wasn't that early in the Sunday ticket. I was just curious about it. So I read an article and a long time ago, why the NFL chose direct TV, which didn't have nearly the share of the television, you know, home television market as uh, the standard cable uh, subscribers would have, why they did that. And what I found out was that they did it intentionally. They didn't want to go to cable because the majority of people were cable subscribers, not satellite TV subscribers. And the affiliates, and in those cases, it was really just Fox and CBS, wanted, they needed to be protected. So the NFL intentionally held the market share down. It goes a little deeper than that, but that's really the start of this, isn't it? Yeah, this is a lawsuit that ended up with a jury verdict, as you said, of $4.7 billion. According to antitrust law, for people who don't know, these verdicts are treble, tripled. Mm-hmm. So the total damages would be, if this ever goes through, would be over $14 billion. We're a long way from that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the gist of this is the NFL conspired with CBS, ESPN, Fox, NBC to keep the out of market price uh, premium so high Mm -hmm. that it is a conspiracy and against antitrust law and it's not a competitive price. Antitrust requires competition. So there's smoking gun memos in this trial. One was from a couple of the networks saying we need to keep these prices really high so it doesn't denigrate our product. The other was allegedly from ESPN that said, hey, we could offer Packers games or Carolina Panthers games or Lions games or Cowboys games for $60, $70. But the NFL said no. Right. So all these things led to a verdict, which basically said the NFL violated antitrust law. The NFL says, hey, wait a minute. We have an exemption. In 1961, the NFL got an antitrust exemption to sell their media rights collectively, not individually, collectively. Right. And they've done that. Uh, So every game you watch, every listener listening, every game you watch is a national game. There are no local broadcasts. Now, you may only get a few games, but they are national games. So... The NFL said that should apply to out-of-market games. The jury said no. Now, here's the thing, Adam. Yeah. The NFL's got a long way to go. They will appeal directly to this verdict, to this uh, judge, who showed a proclivity for their side during trial, even though the jury decided otherwise, on July 31st. They'll ask to reduce the award or set aside the whole verdict and dismiss it. If unsuccessful there, they'll appeal to the Ninth Circuit, That could take months, if not a year. If unsuccessful there, they could appeal to the Supreme Court. That could take years. So I wouldn't count on any money if you're a plaintiff right now for a long time. (laughs) Uh, Yes, I joked that, you know, if you are a a Sunday ticket subscriber, of which I'm not, and for somebody, I have to watch the Panthers. So I have what I mean, like, it's not exactly always a, an enjoyable experience, uh, but it's my job. So I'm going to watch the Panthers. And I used to be right. a Jets fan, but there's not a great pull to 
uh, even now with the drama around Aaron Rodgers, it's not a great pull for me to watch. Now, I get the best game every week. The best game, the Sunday afternoon game, the late afternoon game is the best game every week or the Sunday night game. So I, I don't see the need for a Sunday ticket, but there are people who live here in Raleigh who want to watch the Bears every weekend or the Lions right. or whoever. And yeah, I mean, the ESPN thing, we can sell your team for a, an individual price. That probably made it even worse for the NFL in trial. My only right. question is the the reality of 1961 when they had when that antitrust exemption was originated to the reality of 2024 or when Sunday ticket began. Those are not the same, nor is this package because it's entirely voluntary. So I'm not sure. I mean, it might be a good legal argument, but I'm not sure it's a good common sense argument. Right. I think that makes sense. What you're saying is that's what the jury said. This is not this is not a time you can compare to 1961. <laughs> uh, but I think what what the jury can you know, I could have predicted this maybe. You know, picture yourself on a jury. You've got subscribers, including bars and restaurants and consumers, mm -hmm. that may feel like they're being gouged. And then you've got a $20 billion a year corporation. Who are you going to side with? Now, when the NFL gets in front of an appellate court, there's no jurors. You know, right. There's, there are these judges who tend at the higher levels to be more pro-business. I've seen this in the NFL for years, covering pick a, pick a case, Tom Brady case, mm. the collective bargaining agreement cases, the lockout cases. They all win for the players at the lower level, and they lose at the higher level to the league. So talking to NFL attorneys, I can tell you this, they feel fine. They feel like right. we have the good arguments, whether you believe them or not. And we will win either with this judge or the appellate court judges. At Andrew Brandt on Twitter, I saw you do a uh, another podcast about this, and you said that the, if the NFL thought that there was a danger of them really losing, they would have settled this case. They have settled other cases before. Yeah. The interesting thing is that in... Yes, I know people, who are you going to side with? You're going to side with uh, the consumer or a $20 billion corporation. The funny thing is, is that public sentiment, and I don't know the basis for this uh, other than we've, we've seen this happen for years and years and years. It seems like the general public never sides with the player in a labor dispute. They always side with management. And I can't figure out why, because they would never do that against their bosses like the bosses are trying to pay players as little as they can possibly get away with. And yeah. every, like me against, I mean, I'm not really calling out my bosses here. I hope, hope they understand that. Uh, I know the deal. I know what, what bosses are trying to do. I just don't understand why the general public don't ever side with players. I, I wonder if they just take, oh, it's a kid's game. I'd play for nothing, even though they wouldn't. You know, that's really interesting because I, I cover collective bargaining agreements all the time, and I've been very critical of the NFLPA and some deficiencies that I've seen in those contracts. And again, these are collective contracts, mm -hmm. and I've noticed that. I've noticed the public, and some people's like, Andrew, you know, what do you, what's the problem? They're, they don't have any leverage, they're, they're not going to strike. And I'm like, they, you don't understand the leverage they do have. This is the collective workforce of the most popular sport in the history of the world. So they have some leverage. But you're right. I have found that the public sides with players in individual contract negotiations. Yeah. <laughs> much more than the union in collective contract negotiations. And at the end of the day, siding with the union is more important because you're talking about thousands and thousands of players and not just the few players that hold out. So I am, I am a just as confounded as you why this <laughs> public reaction to the contract negotiations. Listen, the NFL needs these players. Like yeah. If they get to a, they sign these 10, 12 year collective bargaining agreements and I just shake my head. Like, 
and they give away the 17th game and they'll give away the 18th game oh, yeah. and they won't they won't get anything <laughs> back for the franchise tag and they won't get anything back for this commissioner power and everyone says well you should take what you can get because they're not going to strike i'm like no then you need a, a high schooler could negotiate that they, they made the medical use of marijuana a bargaining chip when yeah. it might have been better for the like they should be doing everything that would be beneficial to players, but they use some stuff like that as bargaining chips, so they'll uh, they'll be forced to swallow the seventeenth, and we know the eighteenth game is coming, and yeah. that that the general public buys into Roger Goodell saying, "Well, I'd rather play an eighteenth game than have another preseason game," as though those two things are like balance out the scale. And they're not even on the same planet. It bothers me because, well, we know why. But, uh, you know, it's it it always confounds me. Very quickly, we only have a couple of minutes left with Andrew Brandt. This has been a real treat for me. Uh, hope not. Hopefully not too painful for you. Uh, the Charlotte, uh, the, the Carolina Panthers just got a, you know, approval for stadium renovations using $650 million in taxpayer money. In fairness, that money has been set, asp- set aside specifically for tourism uh, and earmarked for things like this, so I get it. Uh, Jacksonville is more of a 50-50 split between Shad Khan's money and the city's money. Um, when things like this come up for popular vote, they get voted down, which is why the Chiefs might end up in Kansas City, Kansas, as opposed to Missouri. But when they are... Given to the city council, they are always approved. Why? They don't want to be the person, the people, the group that loses the team. And it is that, I think, infinitesimal leverage that David Tepper or Shad Khan or Clark Hunt have that there is a point oh 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 one percent chance they'd move. They're not moving. I'm here to tell you. I'll put my stake <laughs> in the ground. The Panthers weren't moving. The Jaguars weren't moving. The Chiefs aren't moving. Listen, I don't know why. I, that's my answer, that they don't <laughs> want to be on the hook. But the owners always win here. And, yes, they're billionaires. Yes, they could privately finance stadium construction or renovation. Right. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. And they don't. Why? Because they can. They don't have to worry. Um, Just amazing to me. And I always say to people, listen, now that L.A. and Vegas are taken, where exactly were they going to move? Toronto. (laughs) They're not going to to Toronto. (laughs) They're not going to St. Louis. They're not going to San Diego. They're not going to Salt Lake. Come on, people. So they won. And... Listen, New York State, eight hundred fifty million oh, bills. Gosh, Nashville over a billion. Nashville over a billion to the Titans. Yeah, but what, that could have come from Vince Gill by himself. <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> to me that this happens all the time. But hey, L.A. and California just said no to Cronky, and he built the SoFi Stadium with his own money. Now he's got twenty billion, but <laughs> so does. So does David Tepper. Right. So, Tepper bought the team for cash. He could for cash. He could have he could have had like uh, uh, Carolina Kitchen and Bath come in and redo the entire upper deck of Bank of America Stadium uh, and paid <laughs> cash for it himself. Uh, Andrew Brandt at Andrew Brandt on Twitter. The Sunday Seven newsletter is a must. I am a subscriber. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. You got it, Adam. People are asking. So you just go to mysunday7.com and you sign up. You get a newsletter. You get my videos. And I also do these reels at Andrew Brandt 2 at Instagram. So hope to oh. see everyone soon. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. And-